All right, if you have a Bible tonight, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And Deuteronomy chapter 33, I want to preach your message tonight on verse 3 in the passage. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 3. It's an Old Testament passage, and in that passage, uh, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel, and yet he says something that's true of all saints at any time. And in this passage, he gives the three positions of the Christian in this age. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 3. And Moses is speaking, and in the passage he says, in effect, he says he loved all the people. He loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. They sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy word. And that passage right there in just one verse, the Holy Spirit uh, has shown you your position in Christ. Now, the first thing about the passage is this. He says uh, he loved the people. He loved the people. That's the first thing about it. Uh, he says in another place in the Old Testament, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Uh, the Bible says that uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know, uh, people are so fickle, they're so fickle, that when they get saved, I think sometimes they actually think, that God's going to sell them out and step out on them and quit loving them. I mean, they do something wrong, they think, well, God has forsaken me. God has not forsaken me. If he loved you once, when you were a sinner, he'll always love you. If, lo if he loved you in the condition you were in before you were saved, you don't have to worry about his love now. You know why folks always out in the salvation? Because they're fickle. They're fickle, that's why. They think God is just as fickle and changeable as human beings. And he's not. He's not. He says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. He was the friend of sinners. The Bible says that we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And listen, if he was a friend of sinners and died for you when you were ungodly, then don't you worry about your present condition in Christ. If he loved you then, he loves you now. And this reminds me to, to say that one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible is the eternal security of the believer. And when I say that, I mean once you have been born again, you cannot be unborn again. Now, that's the most radical doctrine a man ever taught, because every church, every major denomination, the face of this earth, teaches that a Christian can lose salvation except the Presbyterians and the Baptists. Those are the only two groups that teach that the, in the perseverance of the saints. That is, when God saves a man, he'll hold him up to the end. And the reason why that's an unpopular doctrine and the reason why that uh, brands me as a minority group is because, again, human nature is not only fickle, but it's self-righteous. And you have something deep down in your heart and soul that just insists that you've got to have some part of your salvation and what God won't give you a coin. He won't give you a coin. He says, I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repent. I not have sacrifice, he says. I want to have mercy on you. God doesn't want to make you a good little boy so that you're good enough to work it out. He's not interested in that. He's interested in being merciful to you as a sinner. And listen, if he died for you as a sinner, which the Bible said he did, and was buried loose from the dead and loved you when you were yet in your sins and died for you, then there's one thing for certain, he's going to get you through if he has to kick you all the way. <laughs> there's a verse in the book of Hebrews that says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chasing, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chases not? But if you be without chastisement, where are all the partakers? Then he says, your bastards are not sons. Isn't the Bible a brutal book? <laughs> it says, if you don't get a whipping from God, it's because you're not in the family. You're somebody else's child. And listen, if you're God's child, you're going to get a whipping if you do wrong, but God's going to get you home. I wish people could understand that. Down south, they say, well, do you believe once saved, always saved? No, I don't believe that. I believe once born again, you can't get unborn again. <laughs> That's what I believe. <laughs> you, you know why I don't teach once saved, always saved? Because a lot of folks think they're saved and aren't. And a lot of folks are counting on the worst to save. I talked to a fellow one time. I said, are you saved? He said, well, I was once. I said, well, how'd you know you were? He said, man, I lived it. Well, I said, do you still live it? He said, nope, I'm not saved anymore. He never saved the start yet. I mean, you're not saved by something you're doing. You're not kept saved by something you're doing. 
so personally. You don't work to get saved. You don't work to stay saved. You work because you are saved. I wish folks to get that. I mean, look here. If you, you men that's building a night that have children, if you have a son, he's born of your seed. He'll always be your son. You may disown him. He's still your son. The cops may get him. He's still your son. He may die in electric chair. He's still your son. He can't be unborn again. The Bible said a Christian is born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And the Bible makes it plain, when I'm born again, I'm not born of corruptible seed. The first time I was born, my seed was no good. I was born the first time my daddy's seed, and his seed was no good. And his daddy's seed was no good, and his daddy's seed was no good. That's why they bury us. You know why they bury you? Because your great, 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 go back to Adam, the seed is no good. And if you doubt that, God's going to prove it to you with a very, uh, a very graphic demonstration someday. The undertaker is going to take your body and take the clothes off your body and wash your dead body and pump you full of formaldehyde, and they're going to put you to bed with a shovel. Now, what about that? <laughs> now, what about that? You know, God has a way of proving to all mankind that at his best, he's good for nothing but dust to dust and ashes to ashes. Your seed's no good. You have to be born again. Have you ever been born again? The Bible says when a man's born again, he's born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And if you're born again, then you're God's child. And if you're God's child, you're in God's family. And if you're in God's family, you're God's seed. And if you're God's seed, you are his seed forever, because he's your father and begat you. Or uh, if your name is Brown, you begat a boy and his name is Brown, when that boy dies, he'll have brown as seed sown. You know why? Because he's your seed. Folks say, well, what if? Well, he's still brown. So no if to it. If a child doesn't behave, you whip it if you love it. If you love it, you whip it. You don't know if they whip them and don't love them, and down south they love them and don't whip them, and all comes out about the same way. But you're supposed to love men whip them. I mean, whom the Lord loveth, he chased me. A fellow said, I was raised across the knee. He said, I was raised at the knee of a devout mother and across the knee of a determined father. And that's a good way to be raised. Love men with me. Listen, there's a man this building that would take his son and take his son and put his son in an oven and burn him. And when Christ says somebody's going to go into a furnace of fire and there should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, he is not talking about his son. He's not talking about sons of God. And right there, that's where a modernist makes a mistake. A modernist assumes that everybody is a son of God. A modernist assumes, you know, fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. That old pagan doctrine, they brought over from Africa. The Bible doesn't teach that. You can't find anywhere in the Word of God. He says, you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You go tell a Buddhist over in Asia that he's a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He'll last you seen out of the country. You go tell a communist in Russia that he's a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man is the biggest hope that ever ever pulled in this world. Give the word of truth in it. Don't you believe it for five minutes? The idea is somebody going around saying God is everybody's father. What a blasphemous thing to say. I mean, if a man said that you were the father of every child in this town, I wonder how you'd feel. That's something to think about. You know that? I mean, these liberal standing these perfect God is everybody's father. He is. Oswald. Southwestern. Hitler, for the boy Floyd, Costello, Machine Gun Kelly, Alvin Carpus, John Dillinger, Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker, Al Capone, you sure? You sure? Folks just don't think, you know. They run there and say, God is everybody's father. No, he's not. But so listen, if you're God's child, then like the song says, stay for my eyes, stay for my eyes. Underneath are the everlasting arms, and he's going to get you through. Listen, if he loved you, if he loved you and had a place for you in his heart, he's going to get you through. The Bible said, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. God commanded his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and he's going to get me through. It may be hard, and it may be rough, but he is going to get me through. Uh, you know, many years ago, there was a, an, uh, uh, an emperor named Napoleon that got a lot of folks killed and caused quite a stir. And people forget things pretty quick. 
and one of his emperor, one of his, his emperor's soldiers was killed in the battlefield. And that man was lying there dying. They were trying to cut a bullet out of him and t- trying to save him, and they weren't able to do it. But when they were digging around his chest to get that bullet, you know what that dying soldier said? He said, cut a little bit deeper and you'll find the emperor. Meaning in his heart, you see. And if God had a place for you in his heart, the verse says he loved the people, he's going to get you through. He's going to get you through. He will get you through. One time during the terrible persecutions in the Dark Ages, uh, which were run uh, under a church-state system, a lady was asked to show her her husband was out, and she'd smuggle him out the back door, and he'd run for his life to get away. And when these people came around and demanded where he was, she said, if I tell you where he is, will you promise not to torture me to death? And they said, we promise we, we won't kill you or torture you if you'll show us where he is. And so while her husband got out of town as quick as she could, he could get, that lady took him on a wild goose chase through a bunch of back alleys and up and down stairways and in different houses and finally up into an attic of an old abandoned house. And when she got up there, she said, all right, I'll show you where he is. And they said, where? And she said, right in my heart and nowhere else. And that's the only place you'll ever find it. And God Almighty had a place for you in his heart and thought of you at Calvary, up here in the 20th century in Dayton, Ohio, that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. And it was a place in his heart for you. And he was a friend of sinners and ate with publicans and sinners and received sinners. He will receive you and he will get you through. I don't know how it has to do it or what it has to do to you to get you through, but he's going to get you through. All right, the next time our text says, not only love the people, but it said all his saints, all his saints are in thy hand. Now you're in his hand for security, to take care of you. And you're in his hand for safety. He's got your, like the song says, safe am I, safe am I, in the hollow of his hand. You're safe. You're in his hand. Years ago, a little Scott girl had to cross the moors at night, and she was scared to death. And her daddy said, never mind, Lassie. He said, hold my hand, and I'll take you across. And they started out across the moors. There was some old owl out there hooting on a dead limb of a tree. And she said, uh, but daddy, I don't like it. I don't like it. He said, hush your mouth, Lassie. I didn't say you'd like it. I said, it'll get you through. <laughs> and took her right on across. And God doesn't promise you'll like it all the trip, folks. He doesn't promise you'll like it all the way, but he'll get you through. He'll get you through. He says that in his hand, it's an everlasting love. He says in another place, he says, The Lord will not leave you nor forsake thee. The Lord will not leave us forsake thee. And we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. The Lord is my helper, I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. The Bible says in the book of Jude, He is able to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Uh, my Bible makes it very plain that God is able to finish that which He has performed, and God is able to get you through. Many times when I've been up there, way up in the sky, about 18,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, riding those big old jets, I thought we never were going to get through. I thought we never would make it. We left Cleveland, Ohio one time about two months ago on one of those things, and when it got to Atlanta, it had ice on the wings and couldn't land. And it got to Tampa, and the fog pulled in and it couldn't land. And that bird went crawling out of Miami. Boy, when he came in, I don't know how much fuel he had left in there, but it wasn't much. He had enough to get him to Atlanta, and he went on to Miami. And that plane flew, flew that whole trip like that. When he got the top of his flight and set a level off, he just threw the, threw the whole thing like that, straight up on the fuse. And, you know, back there in the cabin, uh, back behind that cabin, I was back in there and, and thinking about all the things that could go wrong, you know, and this and that. And I thought to myself, well, he's a pilot. He knows what he's doing. And if he can't get us through, nobody can. And I tell you, folks, you have committed your soul to Jesus Christ your soul's in his hand. He said, no one's able to pluck them out of my father's hand. My father gave them to me as greater than all. No one's able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And bless God, he's a pilot. And if he can't get you through, nobody can. Imagine the fellow thinking, now that I'm saved, I'm going to work it out myself. Well, you don't know what, you don't know how to get there. You couldn't get there if you tried all night. You tried to get saved. Some of you for 30 years never got saved. And God just had to save you for knocking down and showing you what a mess you've made of things. Now what you going to do, get up and keep on with the mess? <laughs> uh, one time a little boy brought something to his daddy. He said, fix it, daddy, fix it. And he started to fix it, and the boy grabbed it out of his hands. And he brought it back again and said, fix it, daddy, fix it. 
And the old man started to fix it, and the boy said, I want it. And it's fixed now. The daddy said, no, it's not. And the boy said, let me have it. And he took it. And about 50, 50 minutes later, he came back and said, it's broke, daddy. Fix it. And the daddy said, I'll fix it, but you got to give it to me and let me take care of it. You see? And if you want to get to heaven, listen, you give your soul to Jesus Christ, and you let him take care of it. You don't take care of it. You're unable to take care of it. You give it to him. You give it to him. Safety and security. He's loved thee with an everlasting love. And that's a comforting thought. Folks, to know tonight that the, the hand that the hand that holds this world and holds the universes and constellations and galaxies and keeps the sun, moon, and the stars in their orbit, that's the hand that mops my brow when I get sick. And that's the hand that feeds me at the table. And that's the hand that puts the clothes on the back. He said, how much more shall he feed you and clothe you, oh, ye of little faith? He's going to take care of them. He said in one time in the Gospels, he said, none of them law is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And folks say, well, Judas lost it. Why, Judas never had it. Judas was a devil. John chapter 6, verse 70 and 71. Folks stick with me. Talk about Judas losing his salvation. He wasn't saved. He wasn't even a human being. The Bible said he was a devil. Did you ever hear of a saved devil? <laughs> No, he wasn't saved. Why, Jesus said, I've kept him. And then in John chapter 17, he said, Father, he said, I've kept him. And he now said, he said, you keep him. You keep him. That's a wonderful thing. He said, Father, he said, I've kept him. And he said, now you keep him. And turn him over to God the Father. Uh, the Father never lost one of them. He said, not a single one of them is lost, but the son of perdition. There's one case in history for God Almighty ever lost one person that he ever saved. You can't name a case. Now, you want to go back in the Old Testament and fool around there, all right, but I'm talking about since the crucifixion, and we're living this side of the crucifixion. We're not living back there, back in the Old Testament. Uh, since the gospel of the grace of God, the fellow is saved, and he's kept by the power of God. And the Bible says you are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Bible says you're kept by faith, and the Bible says you're kept to an inheritance undefiled, reserved in heaven for you that are kept by the power of God. Uh, I'm going to make it. I don't know how to make it, but I'm going to make it. I'm not able to make it, but I'm going to make it. Because I've got a pilot that's going to get me through. Did you ever think how ludicrous it is for all these churches in Dayton to be standing up and singing Christian hymns when the poor creditors are singing the hymns don't even know where they're going when they die? You talk about hypocrisy. You think all these churches you got here in town folks hold up to him and singing, we shall sing on that beautiful shore, the melodious songs of blessed. And you ask them if they're saved in the street, and they say, I hope so. Isn't that weird? A fellow down, a fellow, a fellow down in, uh, in Pensacola, he's telling folks how to get saved in the radio, you know. He just tell them to repent, confess, believe, and be baptized. You know, he's a Campbellite. And uh, I stopped him one day outside the station, and I said, uh, you tell these folks how to get saved? He said, that's right. I said, are you saved yourself? He said, well, I hope, I hope to be. <laughs> and I said, you need to tell me you're telling these folks something you don't even know yourself? Well, he said, the Bible tells us what to do to be saved. I said, well, what do I have to do to be saved? He said, you've got to repent, confess, believe, and be baptized. I said, have you repented? He said, yes. I said, you believe? He said, yes. I said, you confess? He said, yes. I said, you've been baptized? He said, yes. I said, are you saved? He said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, did you, know, did you know religion is the only thing in the world that you can get away with stuff like that in? If you tried that in the law practice, the medical, medical practice could have you shingled out off that office in 24 hours. Well, so stand up there and tell them folks how to do something and don't even know what he's talking about. Listen, Jesus Christ never lost a one of them. Uh, back, back in the early days when I was much younger, I went to infantry school at Fort Benning, the infantry school, and was back there in the days of World War II. And back there in those days, they gave us some pretty rigorous training. They trained us with live artillery, you know, and live ammunition, overhead fire, and planes, and bombs, and all this and that. And they allowed, uh, they allowed 5% casualties in training. And one of the things we had to do was run through a jungle course, and they had these dummies spring out, spring up out of the ground, drop down out of trees. They gave you one shot to shoot them, and if you didn't, get them in one shot, they mock you off the list. And they had problems where you threw grenades and rushed pillboxes and this and that. And I never forget, there was one obstacle there, there was a, 
It was a stream, a real rough flowing stream, fast flowing stream, and there was a, a rope over it. And the rope was 10 feet high, tied to two trees. And when you got to that station, the sergeant said, okay, buddy, here's the situation. You're crossing this stream. This stream is being interdicted with artillery fire. Your unit has gone forward. You have orders to take Hill 65 up there. He said, you and the column that comes your turn to cross. He said, you may get shell while you're trying to cross. Move out. you got to move. So you look at that stream, see, and uh, it, it, it's going down there pretty fast, about 10 feet deep in rocks. You know, and I, a kid ahead of me, he stopped by that sergeant, and he said, well, uh, you, he said, do you lose many men in this obstacle? And he said, uh, no, he said, we always find them after a few days. <laughs> and this kid, this kid climbs up this thing and starts to crawl, and here come, then they have this simulated artillery shell that comes. And you got to do something, see? And you're out there, you're upside down, hanging off that rope with 68 pounds of your back, and you're hanging upside down by that thing 10 feet in the air, and here comes. And you can either get across, you know, or go back, or drop one, and you don't have any time to make up your mind, you just got to do something. And I remember when I got out there in the middle of that thing, I had a, I had a fearful premonition I should have let go. But I had my, all my equipment on, and I didn't want to show where the rocks were in that thing. So I just went on across, and that's what you're supposed to do. But I fell out and dropped. A lot of fellas come that thing, man, just drop right in that water. And that old sergeant said, no, we, we, we always find them after a day or two. <laughs> Did you know I thank God, folks, my salvation tonight does not depend upon me hanging upside down by my hands and feet to a rope, and they might find me in two or three days if I drop? I ain't going to drop. I'm not only in his hand, I'm part of his hand. First Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says when a man saves, he's in Christ's body. He's in Christ's body. Safety and security, safe am I, safe am I in the hollow of his hand. And I didn't know. My text also says, and they sat down, every one. They sat down at his feet. I recall a woman one time that sat down at his feet to learn the word. And he said, Mary has chosen that good part that cannot be taken from her. And I recall a Syrophoenician woman that got down at his feet one time in prayer and tried to get a request answered. And I recall a leper one time that got down at his feet and thanked him for doing something. And I recall a maniac of Gadara that got down at his feet one time and sat there closed and in his right mind and wanted to go and be with Jesus and follow him. And Jesus told him, he said, go home and, and show it great things the Lord has done for thee and how he hath had compassion upon me. And when we talk about being at his feet, that means in submission submission. And that's a hard word, isn't it, brother? A hard word. And you know when I say that word, I realize it's easier to say than it is to obey. Submit. At his feet, you see. Him up here, you down there at his feet. At his feet. All his saints are in my hand. They are at thy feet. And every one shall receive of thy word. And as sure, as sure as you live and breathe, if you're a born-again child of God, sooner or later in your life there's going to come a time when God's going to let something come, and it'll come your way, and, and when it comes, it's going to knock you down, and it's going to put you in the dust, and when that time comes, it's going to be the worst time in your life, and right then and there, you're going to determine whether you're going to go the rest of the way victoriously trusting the pilot, or whether you're going to try to bail out and get a shoot down and do it your way. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe any Christian really been tested when those kind of things come. And when those kind of things come, they can draw you close to the Lord, or they can shove you away from Him. Either way, he's going to get you through. He's going to get you through. You say, what if I take a parachute out? He'll have a jeep waiting for you when you get on the ground. <laughs> you know, in the army one time had a fellow go up and they, they told him when he got ready to jump out, they said, if your first chute doesn't open, pull your second chute. And he said, we'll have a jeep waiting for you when you get on the ground. And that old boy bailed out there and pulled that first chute and it didn't open. And he pulled the second chute and it didn't open. And his whistle down to the air, he said, ain't that something? Ain't that something? He said, I bet they won't have that Jeep there either when they get on the ground. <laughs> and what I'm saying is this. One way or another now, the Lord is going to get you through. And uh, when the time comes when he takes back that big old uh, leather strap and lays it across your uh, back, spiritually speaking, then right there you're going to have a crisis in your life, and you're going to get down and submit, or you're going to face him and rebel. And I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. You know, uh, people lose children. They lose children, they get terribly bitter. I've seen people down south that when they lost a child, they blamed God for it ever since and never did forgive him. 
And some of those Christians have no victory in their life at all. No victory at all. They're mad at God. They're going to stay mad at God, I guess, for time and eternity. And they just made up their mind they will not forgive him. I talked to a young couple the other day that lost a child, and, and I never saw anybody that age so bitter. They were, they were young people, and about, uh, oh, they're in their 20s, and they lost a little boy about uh, four years old. And they were, they were blaming God for it and saying, why God has to do this and why God has to do that. And I went to the scripture with them and tried to reason with them and couldn't get anywhere and tried this solution, tried that solution, couldn't do anything with them. And, and finally, I just kind of put out with them. I guess got a little mad, but you shouldn't have. And I said, well, I said, you have stop thinking about this. I said, maybe God took that child and put that child up in heaven for you folks to get your mind off this earth for a while and get it up there. And one of them said, well, you really think you do a thing like that? And I said, you bet your life you do a thing like that. The Bible says, lay not up your treasures on earth, but lay your treasures up in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That Bible says, set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. And you're living in a generation where born-again people of God have all their affections set right down here on the house and the car and the lawn and the children and the job. And you folks up north are worse than them down south along that line. You know what? I mean, if I had you, if I had to have you stand up right now and tell me what things in heaven are precious to you, some of you couldn't name two of them. And that Bible says, set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. If you had to stand right up now and give a list of things that are precious to you up there, what would you say? I know you say, I know you're born again, I know you love the Lord, but my God, how this world has got a hold of you. You know what God will do? He'll just reach down there and take a little old lamb out of the cold and walk off to the bow or something with him, and, and you never will be the same. You never will be the same. You have your affection set in the right place. You have your affections where they ought to be. Set your affections on things above and not on things in this earth. And, you know, you, you try to comfort yourself in the matter, and yet the fact is God's just dealt with you, and he hurts you, and there's no use to get mad at him, and there's no use to pretend it isn't God. It is God. Don't be an atheist and say, well, there isn't any God. There is, too. He's dealing with you. He's dealing with you. You know, the folks up north, they get smart, you know. God knocks them down, they get smart. Well, there's no God. Well, if it was a God, he wouldn't let a thing like that happen. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, you need to tell me that God, you know what kind of business? It won't do you any good. Listen, if you're saved, you're at his feet. Submission. Submission. So get down. Get down where he can bless you. Get down where he can bless you. I mean, think about your children. I mean, uh, if you had to live it all over again, would you like to live it all over? I mean, uh, maybe God took that child to save him with something terrible. You don't know. Uh, the Lord knows what he's doing. And besides that, listen, when you make a trip in an airplane, uh, the whole joy of the trip depends upon who's waiting for you. I mean, uh, if there's somebody there waiting for you that loves you when you get there, it's always a more pleasant trip. And some of you folks, you know, the, the, the pleasure in a trip is who's going to meet you when you get there. And if the kids have gone on, you've got somebody to wait for you when you land. And then sometimes God will take a Christian and bankrupt him. I've known Christians that tithe, and, and things still didn't work out. I preach folks ought to tithe, I preach ought to give above the tithe. And right now, let me say, as a word of per personal testimony, I've always tithed ever since I was saved, and there was only one time that I quit tithing, and that was for about uh, three months. Uh, about six months after I was saved, and that time I just about starved. <laughs> I just about starved. I mean, I got down where I had nothing to eat for three days. No, nothing to eat at all, man. Nothing in that trailer. And the third day, I was so hungry I could eat the floorboard. And I went over and I found me some old flour that the family before had left in the trailer. It must have been there a year. I didn't have any milk, so I made myself some pancakes out of water and flour. <laughs> Did you ever eat pancakes made out of water and flour? <laughs> Just blue like paste. <laughs> Ate them and got sick. <laughs> and the next day, and the next day, somebody came by there and left a pile of groceries in the front of that trailer, all full of canned goods and things. And I began to tithe again. And I'm not saying it's infallible. I, I personally, I've always tithed since that time and give it above the tithe. The Lord has always blessed me and taken care of me. But I know a fellow down in Panama City was faithful in the tithe and the fellow went bankrupt. I mean, God just tried that fellow out. And you know, he was singing the blues and singing the blues. And maybe I'm talking to somebody like that here tonight. And, and I don't know what's the crazy. I mean, 
You've been through some things I haven't been through, and I've been through some things you haven't been through, too. And I tell you, folks, you have to you have to think those things out. I mean, suppose you did have a lot of money. I mean, suppose you just were loaded. <laughs> I mean, uh, the doctor's going to get most of it. You know that, don't you? I mean, they see what kind of a car you drive in, they jack that bill up, you know, two or three dollars. When I go to see a dentist or a doctor, I always take off both my rings and my, and my, and my tie pin. <laughs> and I'm not Scott. I'm not Scott. Yes. And why, listen, if you, suppose you did have a lot of money, the government's going to get it. Why, 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 listen, when you get up around a million dollars, the government gets more than half what you got. Isn't that something? What a humiliating thing to work all your life and have the government wind up with half of it, and you worked half your life for the government, didn't even know it. Why, listen, suppose you do get a lot of money. If you get a lot of money, you have to worry about keeping it. That'll give you ulcers. You'll have everybody's brother solicited, and you're trying to get it from you. All your kin folks will be arguing over it. You'll be afraid somebody kidnapped one of your children to get it. I mean, it isn't too hot to have. I mean, if suppose you did have a lot of money, your kids all be ruined. I mean, I've known kids that have rich mothers and daddies. And once in a while, a good one comes out. Once in a while. Most of them aren't worth shooting. They're not worth shooting. I mean, once in a while, you get a good kid, you know, that had it easy. But most of the people who grow up to be, amount to something are kids that had to work the way and fight the way, usually. I mean, I'm not condemning all you rich folks, but, but you know, there are very few rich boys and girls that had it laid right in the lap that ever mounted a hill of beans. Amen? Well, if you know people at all, you know that. If you know people at all, you have it jump right in your lap, you don't develop any character. I mean, uh, suppose you had the money, you, you, your kids might wind up no good. Now they've got to fight for it. Now they've got to work. Got to get out there in the mill. Got to get out in the factory and hustle. Pay them bills, boy. Buy that insurance for that car. Now you're 20 years old, it costs money. <laughs> Can't get mom and daddy to pay it, can you? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, a kid will drive mighty careful and be real careful with the car if he has to pay the insurance himself. Amen. Everybody over 20 says amen. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, if you have a lot of money, you, and listen, I've noticed this about folks that have a lot of money, and I'm not, I'm not condemning you all, but, but I've noticed that folks have a lot of money, they don't care much for prayer me. You know, something about having a lot of money just kind of kills your taste for prayer. You know that? I don't know what it is. But it's just something about being loaded that just kind of makes you where I'm the worst of sense of driving over there 10 miles and getting down your knees up a bunch of hillbillies and playing with them. You know what I mean? And there's something about that money, you know, that uh, it's good to have, but, uh, but you know, maybe, it, maybe it's best God took it from you. One time a fellow said, he said to a big preacher, he said, I'm broke, I haven't got a, haven't got a dime left. He said, we've well, got treasures in heaven, the fellow was saved. And the fellow went home moaning and said, I'm ruined, I'm ruined, I've lost everything, I've lost everything. And his little boy said, you still got me, Daddy. And his mother said, well, I'm still here. And he said, well, God forgive me. God forgive me. I hadn't thought about that, you know. I mean, uh, he, there's a lot you can lose besides money. To lose your wealth is much. To lose your health is more. To lose your soul is such a loss as no man can restore. And listen, maybe it hasn't been that. Maybe it's some sickness. I, I might be talking to somebody here tonight, and all your life you've had to kneel in the submission at the feet of Jesus and undergo pain and... You know, it's one thing for me to stand up here in good health and talk to you about pain. And it's another thing for me to be lying in a hospital bed going through it. I know that. I know that. And I preach to folks that were in pain all the time. They sat there during the service. And I preach to folks. A lady said to me one time, she said, Brother Ruffin, she said, I haven't taken one breath of air for the last five years about pain going through my body. And she wasn't lying. She's telling the truth. And you know, uh, it's, it's hard to comfort folks like that and tell them how it's going to be, but... But I, I might as well tell you, because that's my duty, uh, uh, cheer up. You get well. You get well. You're going to get well. And one of these days, you're going to change your bandages for a robe and throw away your crutches and get your crown. And, and someday you're going to get rid of those sheets and pillowcases and, and get your throne to sit upon. God's going to get you home. You'll be well. Listen, cheer up. You're going to get well. You know, there are planes. There are planes that fly every minute and every hour from here to glory land. And Lord, he gets you on and take care of you. He said, at his feet, brother, at his feet, in submission, in submission. He says one time in the Old Testament to Israel, he said, you've seen how I've born you? Uh, like uh, a mother eagle bears her young on eagle's wings. 
Jesus says in the New Testament, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the stone is the prophet. Uh, how often I would have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chickens or a brood under her wings, and he would not. He, he says, I, I'm going to carry you through there and get you through like an eagle takes a young and carries a young across. And he's going to get me through under his wings. Under his wings, I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and shadows are wild, yet still I know that he will protect me. He is my Savior, and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his power can sever? Under his wings, my soul will abide, safely abide for said, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's say. Our Father, we pray tonight if there's any unsaved person in this building that doesn't know about this eternal security, that you'll give them eternal life tonight and remind them every day of their life that it's eternal. It's not temporary. It's not something you give and take away. It's not something you give and take away like a, a fickle a pawn shop broker who's afraid of something will get out of heart. You said the gift of God is eternal life. You said it's the free gift. You said whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. And Father, no matter how bumpy the passage or how big the air pockets or how fast the air current or how many storms we have to go through or what altitude, we know you're going to get us home. We can say tonight with Paul, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. And Father, we pray for this blessing for every person within the sound of our voices, right here in this auditorium and out there in Radio Land, across the airways. If there's some man or woman, boy or girl, going through it and having it rough, and they can't understand, show them, Lord, show them. They're either out of that plane trying to fly through there by themselves, and they're going to make a wreck of it, or else they're in that plane, and you're taking care of them, and all they have to do is just 